if you're one of the young people who got your A-level results this week and they weren't what you hoped for, look, it's not the end of the world. It just means there's a fair chance that you'll end up in a career that involves repeating one of these two phrases. Would you like fries with that? Or the UK's number one hit music station. This is Podcast Radio's countdown of the top 20 podcasts in the world right now based on downloads and your recommendations at thepodcastradio.co.uk. Each week I'll be... Dom, is that your phone again? Hello? Oh, no, I'm on with Graham Mack. No ideas, rubbish. At 16, the harrowing... Interesting podcast, this. A -a once-in-a-century storm hits a remote Scottish island. As the isolated community takes shelter, a barbaric crime sets off a chain of events which heralds the rise of an ancient evil and threatens to change the course of history. And Edward Woodward is burned alive inside a giant wicker man as Britt Eklund dances naked and she's got this weird dubbed Scottish accent which never makes... Oh, oh, wait a minute. No, I'm thinking of... I'm thinking of... Stop the bagpipes, for goodness sake! It's a different thing altogether. At last night of the proms, people will be singing the controversial song Rule Britannia, but you won't hear the word slaves. What you'll hear is Britain's never, never, never shall be Smurfs. They'll be singing slaves, but it'll sound like Smurfs because they'll be wearing face masks. Sean Williamson, you'll know him as Barry from EastEnders. In 2017, you went on Celebrity Big Brother. Why did you do that? Tax bill. Was it? it really? It was a tax bill? I mean, let's be honest. If you see an actor of any calibre on there, it's got to be a tax bill. I was lucky. The youngsters gave me a, a, a fair bit of respect, actually. They weren't a bad lot at all. And uh, there was a, the late Derek Akora was in there. I How did you get trouble. on with, with Derek Akora? They were desperate because we ended up friends. So they were desperate in, in the diary room for me to say he was a fraud. Oh, were I they? I just ended up saying, I believe Derek believes everything he sees and feels. And yeah. that's it. Yeah. Because I've always wanted... I, I mean, he's gone now, He's he, but I always wanted to ask him why he only gets possessed by Scouse ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> Checking in on Zoom, it's Piper Terrett from the Lockdown Lowdown podcast. Last week, we spoke about how I was getting into recording audio books. Oh, yeah? How's the audio book going? My biggest worry is the neighbours at the minute. Neighbours? Yeah. Behind that wall just there is the neighbour's bedroom. Ah. And I'm doing these, you know, that that last one I told you about the battle scenes. Yeah. You know, come on, you bloody bastards! And I mean, I'm getting (laughs) right into it. It's bayonets and whatever. (laughs) But there was an awkward sex scene in a temple. (laughs) In a temple? Uh, in a temple, yeah, an oh, Indian dear. temple, and you know, there's, you know, there's all that, and I'm I have to play both parts, and like, <laughs> <laughs> what they must be thinking. Jonathan Brandmeier is on Zoom in Chicago, and now you've got this new online show, which has gone global. We had one listener who says here. Uh, Johnny, you're live in London. Just let you know I'm hearing you loud and clear on my laptop in London. Great. Yeah. Well, they, I mean, they, they won't know the things you do. They won't know about the Hall of Fame. They won't know about 14 years at the loop. We, they won't know about, they won't know that you appeared with Mary Tyler Moore in a TV movie. Uh, thank you. What was that like? That, that was honestly, that was fantastic. I just enjoyed that immensely. And, uh, She, I I don't think anyone could be kinder than that woman, but I don't know if you're familiar. Are you familiar with the movie Ordinary People where Mary Tyler Moore yelled that, uh, I think it was Timothy Hutton and said, give him the goddamn camera when they were trying to take a family picture with uh, with, uh, Donald Sutherland and Timothy Hutton and taking the picture. So I got to see that person for one minute. We were doing a scene 
I, I just kind of lost track for that one moment in time doing the scene. And I kept coming in and screwing my lineup and coming in and screwing my lineup. And then she just goes, can we just take, she tells the director, we're just going to take a break for a second. She goes, come here for a second. She puts her arm around me. I kind of walk out the door and she goes, get your act together. <laughs> Ken Levine, you're a writer, director, and producer, and you've even done a bit of acting on The Simpsons. Oh, man, I did everything on The Simpsons, Graham. I did everything on The Simpsons. I'm also kind of an amateur cartoonist, and it was an episode called Dance and Homer. Wait. A few YouTube people. There he is. <laughs> there he is. Dance and Homer, holding it up. Podcast people have no idea what I'm talking about. Um <laughs> held up a dancing Homer doll. Yeah. He becomes a, a mascot for the minor league team, and he gets to move up to the major leagues to substitute for the Capital City Goofball. And I designed the Capital City Goofball. You designed it? I designed it, yeah. Wow. And they used my design. So it was like, oh, man, there's like a cartoon character. And for the minor league team... They wanted to have an announcer, so I said, uh, "I'll announce." I'll, you <laughs> know, got the experience. I got the experience. I'll do it. So I am the voice of the Springfield Isotopes. There's some nut down in right field dancing up a storm. He's really got the crowd going. Let's see if it can shake up mediocre slugger Big Bill McCloskey. Swung on and belted to deep left field. It's going, going, it's gone, it's out of here. Oh my God, the Isotopes win a game. The Isotopes win a game. The Isotopes win a game. Wow, that was certainly exciting. I'm Graham Mack and my guest is Alan Alder. Your podcast is called Clear and Vivid. What podcast do you listen to, Alan? I have, I have so little time because of the work I do. I don't listen to many podcasts. I listen I, I some science podcasts. In our country, we have a radio show called Science Friday, and I like that a lot. I don't listen to many. What podcast do you listen to? I listen to, I like Mark Maron because it's a long-form interview with one of his guests. Yeah, I, 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 he interviewed me and I interviewed him, and he does the same thing. He goes for a conversation. Yeah. I never saw him look at a note while we were talking. He probably had a few things in mind he wanted to talk about. Yeah. But mostly it, it, the conversation happened because things evolved. Yeah. And one of the best podcasts I ever heard was Mark Marin interviewing o a Barack Obama. Yeah, in his garage. <laughs> in his garage. Yeah. And I had never heard Obama be so available before, so unaware that he was the president. Yeah. He was a smart, funny person who could play with Mark Marin. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. He, I, as I remember, the book you were talking about before, "Never Have Your Dog Stuffed." Yeah, it's either that or my second book. I can't remember. I was nominated for a Grammy for reading the book on audio, and so was Barack Obama for his book. <laughs> and of course, he won. <laughs> and I listened, and I knew he would because I listened to his reading. It was fantastic. Talk about playing characters. He could play a variety of people and sound like someone else, but with the attitude, not just the, uh, not just the accent. So are you telling me that a world-famous actor and a man who trains people how to act was beaten by an amateur? He's hardly an amateur. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have the experience and, and the, uh, the credentials that you do, though, does he? He's been on more television shows than I have in my whole life. <laughs> and I suppose he's played a variety of roles as well, because uh, being the president, you have to... Who was it said to be the president? You have to be a cold-blooded killer. You have to be able to order the attack on the, the garrison and then go to the cocktail party. Right, and then go to the survivors when the, yeah. after, after you take off your tux. Yeah. I never have understood because so much of that is true. I've never understood why so many people want to be president. Yeah.
at 13, Hollywood and Levine, the podcast from this week's special guest, Ken Levine. Ken, you and your writing partner, David Isaacs, have worked on so many sitcoms. What was the first long-running show you worked on? It was our first staff assignment was on the Tony Randall show. Okay. Which was for MTM. Yeah. And <laughs> it's a funny Tony Randall story that people in England will appreciate. So we write a script freelance for the Tony Randall show, and they liked it so much that they invited us to join the staff, which was great. Yeah. You know, and this is your first staff job, too. So. This is our first staff job, and it's MTM. It's Camelot. <laughs> this fant- and we're writing for Tony Randall. I, oh, my God. Yeah. So the first day... We come on the stage, the cast gathers together to have a table reading where they all read the script out loud. And there had just been a one-week hiatus prior to this. And they're doing our script. So the cast is sitting around the table and the writers, we're all sitting around the table. And Tony says, well, before I start, I, I'd like to say something. During the hiatus week, I went to London, and while in London, I got a chance to watch some of the British sitcoms of the day. And after watching those, I can say conclusively that the stuff we do here in America is shit. (laughs) Okay, now let's read The Tony Randall Show by Ken Levine and David Isaacs. The Chicago broadcasting legend, Jonathan Brandmeier. There we go, brother. The Mac attack is on. There he is. Okay, I can take these off. Hold on. There you go. G-Mac. I should talk about the first time we met. It was, it, okay, it was, okay. I'm going to say the, it was, a boot camp. Yeah, it was, that that's is? it. It was 2015. It was a thing called the morning show boot camp. It was in a hotel in Chicago. I forget which one. Yeah. And you were about to do your syndicated show on Westwood one. Mm-hmm. And so they had this room full of radio people from all over the world, yeah. mostly the U S and Canada. And uh, Mike McVeigh, who was boss of Cumulus, who owned Westwood One, I think, was he, he was putting on a session. Yeah. He was putting on a session to introduce us to Jonathan Brandmeier because you're about to do this new syndicated show. Mm-hmm. And so we're all there, and it's the last day of the conference. And the conference had been plagued, as radio conventions usually are, with bad sound from the <laughs> from the believe. from the, yeah right yeah, yeah so. Yeah. The, the the sound is bad and, and Mike is doing this whole big intro about Johnny B and Radio Legend and Hall of Fame and the whole thing and the mics cut in and out and stuff. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. a heckler at the back of the room starts abusing uh, Mike McVeigh, who's like one of the main people in in the U.S. radio, one of the main figures who, who who runs a group of radio stations, and this guy's going, "This is ridiculous. This is supposed to be. This is supposed to be a, an audio thing, and you can't even get the sound right. And what's going on here? Whatever." And he walks up to the stage, and everyone in the room's going, "Like, wow, this is really embarrassing." And it was you. <laughs> well, Graham. Isn't that a fact? Here, here's a guy who's he's not <laughs> fired, who's supposed to be and who isn't, who's supposed to be in, in radio. We're in radio. These are conventions, Graham says. It's a radio convention of radio people who do radio, which I believe, if I am correct, it's audio. Audio. Yeah. And he's up there. Anyway, I want to know. What the hell is going on? And I hate long introductions. I hate any of that stuff anyway. I'm not comfortable with any of that. And you know that I was asked to do that. It was called for ladies and gentlemen who are not in the business. It's like a boot camp and you're supposed to go there and tell people how to do radio or whatever it is. And I, yeah. It's, they would ask me a lot, almost every year, every other year. Could you just come and talk? to? I said, that is so arrogant, arrogant for me to stand up there and tell you in the audience how to do a radio show. Because if you're really doing a radio show or in this case, a podcast or a stream or whatever it is you do these days, you just got to do what's in your head. Don't let anyone tell, why would Jonathan Brandmeier tell you how to do a radio show? I don't know 
I just knew well, we, we, well, we wanted to hear from someone who's a Hall of Famer. We wanted to hear a guy who's won Marconi Award. We wanted to hear from you, Johnny. But you could, uh, and yeah. to, to this day, <laughs> it's the only time I've been to an event where the star of the event has been heckled by himself. <laughs> you you heckled your own show. <laughs> yeah. I've never seen that before. That's how smart I am. I just heckle <laughs> my own self. <laughs> Alan, you played Hawkeye Pierce on MASH for 11 seasons. How about censorship back then? Because it started in 72. Did that change as the series yes. went along? Could you get away with a lot more? Yes. It turns out that forbidden words are not so forbidden if you're really popular. <laughs> <laughs> Which is counterintuitive. You think you'd be able to get a, away with more when, when hardly anybody's watching it, wouldn't you? When nobody's listening, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in one of the first few shows... Radar had a line in which he said, uh, I, I don't know about that, sir. I'm a virgin at that. With no sexual meaning. It just meant he was unfamiliar with the subject. The censor said, you can't say the word virgin. So Larry Gelbart, the head writer, was really upset at that. So he wrote a line in the next show that he knew they couldn't take out. I say to a kid on a stretcher, where are you from, son? He says, the Virgin Islands, sir. <laughs> Did it become a bit of a game then to see what you could get in? It was a, a morbid game because sometimes you needed the, the juice, the sauce of a word that really has no, no repugnance to it. It's common talk, but they, they were fastidious. I mean, so fastidious that in one show, there's, it's the most show that I wrote, there was a jock strap on a table. Do you use that word over there, jock yeah, strap? Yeah, we, we know what that is, yeah. Okay. So Loretta comes into the, uh, Margaret comes into the tent and sees it and says, how dare you parade that thing before me? Well, the centers were more fastidious than she was. They said, not only can you not have a jockstrap, you can't even have a white piece of cloth representing a jockstrap. On the, now, this, this to, to show the sexism at the same time of the rampant uh, censorship, in many shows I had walked through clotheslines, or the equivalent shot of this, walking through clotheslines filled with women's brassiers and panties. <laughs> But a man's intimate apparel is somehow sacred, and you can't show that. That's, that's forbidden. So the whole thing was silly. The funniest story I heard about censorship on MASH, and maybe you can confirm whether it's true or not. I'll tell you where I heard it. You know Ken Levine, one of the writers on yeah, MASH? He has a sure. great podcast called Hollywood and Levine. And he told this story about... Apparently, there was a, a visiting general or something, and, and the colonel said, uh, to take this man to the VIP tent, and the line was supposed to be, Radar was supposed to say, right this way, your vip <laughs> And, and, and they got good. it. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know about that. Which I think should be fine, because first of all, penis isn't a swear word. And secondly, if kids are so young they don't know what it means, they're not even going to hear it. They'll write this way, your vip -ness. So it just shows how... Touchy, they, they, they could have been. So you, if, if he had said, right this way, your, your vagina, that would have been allowed. <laughs> Based on, the, on, on the, the precedent set over the jockstrap and the knickers, yeah. At 12, BJ Shea's Geek Nation. BJ Shea is my special guest this week. You know, BJ, the last time you and I saw each other in person was way back in 2012. Oh, wow, really? Yeah, it was the uh, the talk show boot camp in New Orleans was the last oh. time you and I were together in the same room. Oh, yeah. I have, and that might have been the last time I did a talk show boot camp. I don't do those anymore. I'll go, I'll go to the morning show ones, but not the talk show ones anymore. It's, I don't really do much of a talk show anymore, I guess. So we, I really wasn't getting a whole lot out of it. And uh, and honestly, my attitude was pretty negative listening to some of the philosophy thrown my way. I think now, uh, upon further reflection, it had more to do with me than them. Um, yeah, but that's I think that might have been the last time I went. 
Really? Yeah, I yeah. was there. I was invited there. I was on a panel. I was on a panel called The Rising Rising Stars, mm. the show that have talk radio buzzing. Um, I think I remember that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my my memory of that was, I think it was the second night you and I went out to dinner with a New Zealander, and to my great shame, I can't remember his first name. His last name was Van Dyke, and he was programming a talk station in New Zealand. Remember him? I believe I do. Yeah. Uh, but I and can't remember his first name either. We we got to the end of the meal and you said, well, do you want to hit the strip clubs now? And I said, <laughs> I said that's not really my thing. Oh, and, well. And, and this guy from New Zealand said, have you ever been to a strip club with, with BJ? I said, no, I've never been to a strip club. I said, it's just not my thing. And he says, oh, no. He, he, we were there last night and BJ made the stripper cry. Yeah, that's uh, that sounds like my M.O. I uh, I end up having more of a father daughter. Well, I don't know if I was. The, well, it could have been a father daughter moment. And then they you know, it gets more like a therapy session, uh, which I don't know if that's good for either one of us, really. But Well, what was it tipped her over the edge? Oh, my gosh. First of all, you're asking me to remember eight years ago. OK, OK. Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, eight minutes ago. I'll tell you right now it was a bit of a challenge, <laughs> but I feel probably uh, you know, it could have been a personal issue. Somehow, some way I had, I just had this way of seeing into people. I felt, here's my thing about going to, and I haven't been, I, that might have been the last time I went to a strip club. I can't remember the last time I was at one. Um, but I felt bad just observing without like making a connection, without knowing. It's like, I, I just felt like I want to give something back. And then, but the trouble is, is it usually goes a little too deep trying to get to know her and next thing you know she's in tears talking about a family member she doesn't get along with uh and and then that 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 sort of has been my interaction with a lot of a lot of people mostly women when i would talk with them i, I would get a little i guess i would get a little too non-surface i don't make small talk very well i really <laughs> go right I go right for the gusto <laughs> just go, and next thing you know water works everywhere um and I did get a bit of a reputation, like, oh, you've got to go to a, you got to go anywhere with him. It's not a typical moment. Uh, not so many people can, you know, you can get a stripper angry by not paying her or insulting her, but making a stripper cry, that's a, and it, you know, that's a whole different level. That <laughs> probably, that's what makes you unique, BJ. That's is what, that what it is. Yeah, it was one of the things, one of the many yeah. things. The former Newsnight presenter, Gavin Esler, in 2012, you published a book called Lessons from the Top, How Leaders Succeed Through the Power of Stories. What are these stories and why are they so important? What happened was I was trying to think. I'd met so many, lead, uh, you know, uh, Blair, Clinton, Thatcher, Angela Merkel, Dolly Parton, who features quite heavily in the book because she's a great storyteller. Lots and lots of people. And I tried to figure out how is it that some people connect and some people don't. I mean, there's some, there's some very bright people who go into politics and they don't quite connect with uh, the general public. And I realised that there's three basic stories and every single one of the successful leaders tell those same three stories. And they are, who am I as a person? Who are we as a group? And then if you're still listening, they can tell you where we're going with this. What, what that leader is going to do. So, for example, Mrs. Thatcher, I'm just the grocer's daughter from Grantham. Bill Clinton, I'm the boy from Hope. And uh, Donald Trump, I'm the greatest billionaire business person in the entire world. Now, this can be entirely fictitious, but it's always only part of the story. I mean, Mrs. Thatcher was many more things than the grocer's daughter from Grantham, but that's the story she wanted to tell. Bill Clinton, when I first bumped into him, and literally bumped into him, he was out jogging, he said, I'm just the boy from Hope, Hope, Arkansas being the town that he came from. Now, there's many other things you could say about these leaders, but that's the one little nugget they wanted to get in your brain. And then uh, where, who are we? Well, you know, Mrs. Thatcher redefined both the Conservative Party and the country and Bill Clinton. You know, we're not the old Democrats. We are the new Democrats. And Tony Blair did the same thing and others. And then if you're still listening, as I say, you might listen to their policies. And one of the problems with some politicians who lose, Hillary Clinton's one, Ed Miliband's another, whatever the greatness or otherwise of the policies, the, the third bit, if they haven't really sold you the idea of who they are in a way that you like, 
everybody knew who Hillary Clinton was, but she was very divisive and many people didn't like her. I don't, I personally don't think people really knew who Ed Miliband was. I mean, he's a very bright, bright guy. Maybe he would have been a good prime minister or a bad prime minister, but nobody listened to his 300 policies or whatever they were until he properly connected. And so that, that's what the book's about. Uh, as a result of that book, I continue to do lots of speaking to businesses in particular because a lot of businesses are trying to figure out what their identity actually is. And quite often the chief executives want to discuss that as well because all leadership positions are quite difficult and people in business have very much woken up to the fact that just to be able to do a good job isn't good enough. I mean, one of the things I say, and this, this came from a, from a banker, uh, a CEO of a major bank who I was discussing this with. He asked me to come in and chat to him. And he said, oh, he said, I get it. I get it. Um, if hard skills were everything, then Spock would have been commander of the USS Enterprise. <laughs> and I said, Brilliant. that's great. I'm going, to put that in the, I'm going to put that in the book the next time I rewrite it. <laughs> The Hollywood scriptwriter Ken Levine. Ken, can we talk about something the LA Times called an epic blog fight? Here's what happened. First of all, I've had a blog for 15 years. Great blog, called too. Called buykenlevine.com. Read my blog and listen to my podcast, Hollywood and Levine. Shameless plug. There was an article in New York Magazine, supposedly written by Roseanne Barr. And I say supposedly because it was w- way more articulate than she ever was. <laughs> and she's complaining in the article about Roseanne and how they ripped her off and that the creator, Matt Williams, took credit for it. And it was her show. And she just, woe is me, woe is me. Anytime an article like that comes out, I will get readers to my blog commenting asking me my thoughts on yeah. it. And I read the article, which I thought was just just a piece of <laughs> shit. And so I wrote articles saying, the show is called Roseanne. <laughs> okay? How is she not getting credit? <laughs> the show is called Roseanne. She owns a major part of it. She's the major creative force on the show. She's starring in a show called Roseanne. And the fact that Matt Williams took undisciplined stand-up material and shaped it into an actual television series, an actual pilot that worked, he's entitled to creator credit. Yeah. He's very much entitled to creator credit. And then I talked about having known a lot of writers who have worked on the show, how absolutely horrid she was to writers. They would go through writers. It was just a revolving door. She didn't bother to learn their names. They would come down for a run through and they would have to wear signs around their necks with numbers. Okay. Okay. That's the regard that that she had for writers. Women writers she treated just as badly or worse. So I write this in my, my blog post. She had a blog at the time, finds out about it, and writes just this scathing. It's like Donald Trump wrote a whole <laughs> blog post. Okay. Assuming Donald Trump could write a whole blog post. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Just insane ramblings <laughs> from a mad woman. Attacking you directly? Oh, attacking me personally. Okay. Yeah. Attacking me personally and saying how I was terrible to writers and I was terrible to women writers. And, and where did she get that info from? Where does Trump get his info? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Pulls it out of her ass. Okay. Right. It's like none of it was true. Yeah. So I read this and, and I go, I'm not going to get into a, a, a shouting match with Roseanne. I said, I, I just, you know, forget it. But a lot of women writers who worked on shows that I was producing 
all wrote letters, you know, jumping to my defense, to my blog. Ken served as a mentor to me when I had my baby. Ken let me go home at six o'clock every night so that I could, you know, feed the baby and put my baby to sleep, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We did the show almost perfect, and it was me and David Isaacs and Robin Schiff. So we had a, a woman who was a third partner. Uh, we brought her into our partnership. So, so I said, I, I'm not going to get into you know, just a verbal debate, but here are what women writers have said. And, and like one of them had worked on Roseanne and talked about how, you know, Ken was, was great. And he was a mentor and he, you know, never came on to us and there was no sexual harassment or anything like that. And, and Roseanne was Auschwitz. So, uh, (laughs) words to that effect. Okay. Okay. So, that sparked another just long, insane rant. And and all of her, you know, minions, idiots, you know, wearing their future MAGA hats. Yeah, he's stupid. He's an asshat. You you know, I, I like, okay. And at that point... I, I just, I wrote in the blog, like, I, I, like, I'm done. Good luck with you. I'm done. And the LA Times picked up on it. I think the USA Today also picked up on it. And it sort of became this story. I think it's on my IMDb page. I think there's... <laughs> it's they, on Wikipedia. Yeah. Okay. That's where I saw it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So... Uh, so it was never resolved. It's still an ongoing thing. Then it's just, it's like, it's like North and South Korea. It's, <laughs> it's... <laughs> Well, let me put it to you this way, Graham. When she was going to do her comeback series, yeah. I was not asked to join the writing staff. <laughs> oh, how about that? Yeah. yeah. Dom Jolly. He was made famous by Trigger Happy TV on Channel 4. After that, Dom, you went to the BBC, but it didn't work out, did it? I, I went to the BBC and I started making this show called 100 Things Do Before You Die. And the idea was... It was like one of those shows, but it was like the wrong person had been given the show. So instead of parachute jumping, I'd lock myself in a fridge and see whether the light went out when the door closed. It was like a weird thing. And we started making it, and I was really chuffed with it. It was for BBC Two. And I'd pitched this at Channel 4 before I left, and they liked it. All the people at Channel 4 left and went to Channel 5, and I'm halfway through making the show. I opened The Guardian, and uh, it said Channel 5 September list... 100 things to do before you die. And the f***ers had just nicked it totally. And they put it out before mine. So I had to go to BBC Two and say, you know what? Uh, They've nicked it and they've done it. So I I have to cancel. And we were halfway through the show. And they said, well, just carry on. I said, no, they've done it already. And it's different. Anyway, it was a nightmare. So that got me a reputation at the BBC for being tricky. So I had to sort of stop. And then I launched BBC Three with a fake chat show. And I called it This Is Dom Jolly. But I was wearing glasses. And it was so obvious to me that it wasn't me. But everyone, I wanted 20% of the people to watch it to think, oh, my God, Dom Jolly's a <laughs> And the other 80% to get the joke. As it was, I think 80% of people watched it and went, God, he's a Because, <laughs> you know, I was just, I was this sort of ego version of me. And I, it was it was clearly faked, but I don't know. Uh, but it had a lot of fun. Had lots of bands on it. I love how The Cure on, The Water Boys, Ian Brown. I mean, everyone, uh, Granddaddy. It was fantastic fun. And then I thought I'd better cash in my chips because I knew the BBC were like, what is this guy doing? So I got a show for BBC One. So I made a kind of international trigger happy called World Shut Your Mouth, which is still my favourite show. (laughs) And I kicked off each show. I thought it'd be really funny. I flew around the world in one trip to all the seven wonders of the world, the Great Wall of China, the pyramids, uh, the Taj Mahal, just to stand in front of it and wait for someone to come up. And I'd go, oh, Taj Mahal. And they'd go, yeah. And i go, well, that is shit. And that was it. That's all I did. And I thought that was the strongest, <laughs> purest beginning. And honestly, when I handed it into the BBC, I could see them just thinking, this man has to leave the BBC. <laughs> so that was it. Your autobiography, Here Comes the Clown, came out in 2015. But, yeah. But 10 years before that, you did a spoof autobiography called Look at Me. Why did the parody one come first? It would seem like the natural breeze would do a normal one and then parody that. Because someone, because when Trig Abbey was at its height, someone came to me and offered me a stupid amount of money to write my autobiography. And I'd always said, 
you should never write. I mean, Martine McCutcheon was on her third volumes of her autobiography at the age of about 23. And I was like, you really shouldn't write an autobiography till you're 50, as far as I'm concerned. I think Britney Spears wrote one before she'd had sex. I mean, how interesting could that have been? Well, I mean, none of these people write their books anyway, for a start. But anyway, so I, so I, I, they offered me a silly amount of money. I couldn't turn it down. And I thought, great, I'll do it. And then the moment I'd accepted, I thought, oh, I can't. Like, it's, I hate these sort of books. So then I thought, I'll do a pastiche. There were, there were a lot of shit autobiographies out at the time. And I thought, I'll write a pastiche one. And then I started writing and it just segued into this weird thing where it sort of is my life, but it's not really. It's like a, it's, you know, I mean, the page two out of Talking Dogs. It's pretty obviously not my life. But people were like, is this real? But actually it was. Like it was Lebanon and then a diplomat and stuff. And it went up to the moment I was famous, but in a sort of totally heightened. It was though I was on acid. I've no idea what that book is. I'm quite proud of it actually now, but it was weird. And it absolutely so, died. So you didn't murder your Armenian nanny and you weren't raped by a TV weather girl and it wasn't covered up? Uh there are a couple of things in there that did happen. I did end up in a weird flat in Edinburgh with a guy that was a weather reporter and uh, was dancing with his Pekingese. I didn't get raped, obviously, but um, there, there are a lot of weird bits in it that are true. I did, uh, there's a Peter Mandelson story in there that's pretty close and there's weird stuff, yeah. According to Wikipedia, you went to the same school as Osama bin Laden. Is that bit true? That is true, yeah. And that is, I mean, I, I talk about that on my... Uh, tour that has been rescheduled but um i did a show where i went off it was called excellent adventure and i was supposed to drive into syria where i used to go as a kid from lebanon so i flew to lebanon with a mate and we were going to go on this road trip into syria but the director said before we go it'd be nice to see what it was like growing up in lebanon let's go to your old school so i went to my old school which is called brumana high school and very weird it's a quaker school in the mountains above beirut and it was built by Quakers from Darlington in 1860. Like, what they were doing there, I have no idea. But anyway, so I went there, and I was filming in the in the grounds because I told I got a fixer, and he'd said, yeah, yeah, we sorted it out. And this woman marches out. She's livid, and she's the headmistress. And it turns out the fixer did what I would have done. He just took the money and f***ed off. He didn't ask anyone. So she had no <laughs> idea what we were doing. So she starts screaming at me, what are you doing here? And I go, I'm really sorry, we're making a documentary. And why? I go, well, because I went to school here. She goes, who gives a shit? So I was like, yeah, fair point. But I was like, to be honest, I think I'm probably one of your more famous alumni. And she looked at me and said, I don't think so. And I go, well, who's more? And she goes, Osama bin Laden. And I go, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so then she panicked because it's a Quaker school. Can you imagine taking prospective parents around and going, uh, you know, Quakers are pacifists and saying, I don't know if you know about our most famous alumni, uh, Osama bin Laden. So they then denied it. And I tried to find a school photo of me and bin Laden because he was 16 and I was six. And this was 1974. Uh, so we were there together for a year. But obviously, I didn't know him. I didn't meet him. I, he didn't look like that at the time. The bin Ladens looked like the Partridge family back then. So, But yeah, I did. Right. So it's a shame you didn't get to know him because you could have maybe convinced him, you know, his life could have gone a different way. It's like these people who say that a time machine, they go back and kill baby Hitler or at least go back and tell him that his art was pretty good. You know, yeah. he could have changed the world. Yeah. So you... Or maybe it, I'd have joined Al-Qaeda. Who knows? Uh, you could have gone the other way. Yes, it could. It, yeah. It, it could have done. It's not good for me when I go to the States, though, because they look at my passport, born in Beirut. Then they look it up online. It says trigger happy, comedy terrorist, went school... <laughs> With Bin Laden, I've got visas from Iran, North Korea, Congo. It's 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 not it's not a pleasant thing when I go to America. Yeah, especially in an airport if you tell them you're there to shoot a pilot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to give a nod to the journalist Piper Terrett. She's got a podcast out called The Lockdown Lowdown. Have you had anything embarrassing happen during lockdown? Embarrassing? No. I got some news this week that can only be described a, a, as a roller coaster of emotion. Oh, no. There is a fine line between comedy and tragedy. And my family in Liverpool straddle that line quite regularly. To give you a bit of background, currently, I'm, shall we say, disconnected from my close family, my 
sister hates me and um, uh, in my mother's eyes my sister can do no wrong so oh, that's horrible. we have nothing to do with each other because any time I've gone up there to, to have any time with either of them I've ended up getting quite hurt actually so I'm not disconnected you know to punish them or hurt them I'm disconnected just to protect me because it's not pleasant now, my dad died in June last year. He was cremated and I didn't go to the funeral because I knew my sister was going to be there and I didn't want anything to kick off because all the, the extended family would have been there. And there's really no words to describe the, the intensity of the hatred that my sister has for me. And, and, and I didn't want that to, to be the focus of the funeral. Yeah. My dad and I didn't have what you would call a, a father-son relationship. Oh. I never actually got the feeling that he even liked me, but <laughs> that's a different thing. Yeah. I never found him to be a, a particular uh, role model. He was such a cheapskate. Really? Yeah. We weren't poor, but he would not spend money. Like, well, something, something as basic as... Um, as school shoes uh, most kids had school shoes yeah i had steel toe capped work boots because he used to steal them from the site he worked on and that's what <laughs> i went to school in oh god <laughs> i know um that's awful yeah a anyway i mean he would know the price of, of every of the pint at, at, at every pub within a 10 mile radius and how much cheaper it was in the club that he went to you know yeah. For my 40th birthday, we were living in Bournemouth at the time and uh, they came down to visit and we went out for lunch at Frankie and Benny's and he wouldn't order any food because he, the deal they were on in their hotel, they got a meal. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. you know. So anyway, but my extended family are lovely mm. and I, I've never felt anything other th than love and, and support and they're wonderful. Mm. And this week, I got an email from my favourite auntie, my mum's sister, my auntie Hazel in Liverpool. She emailed me to say that her brother, my uncle Brian in Scotland, had died. Oh, no. And I was really quite upset when, when I found out because I really, really liked Uncle Brian. Yeah. I mean, he really was someone. I mean, he was an ex-Navy man. He was, you know, generous, and I can remember playing football. He'd come down from Scotland every now and again. It was a real treat yeah. when he'd show, you know. I can remember playing football in the back garden with him when I was about five. And it's funny, I have no memory of, of playing football in the back garden with my father. No. But Uncle Brian died, you know, and there were tears and, and all the rest of it. And it was good because I realized that, you know, I always wonder whether I'm normal. You know, I think that's the number one question a lot of people ask themselves is, am I normal? Yeah. When I found out that my dad had died, once again, it was also my Auntie Hazel that told me that my dad had died last June. I felt nothing. Like nothing. Not like not anger or release or sadness or happiness. I actually, there was nothing. And at the time I was like, wow, there's something wrong with me. Your father dies. You're supposed to feel something really worried mm. and i googled it and i found that kids who didn't have a proper relationship with their father but always wanted one yeah desperately want you desperately want love and approval from from your father yeah. especially a boy of course you do. it turns out that you've actually been mourning them your whole life so when the moment comes that they die you you've you're over you've done it you've been through it yeah and i spoke to dom jolly about it on, on the podcast radio interview I did, and, and he had a similar thing. He said that he, he'd, he'd mourned him for 10 years before. I think I'd mourned my dad for a lot longer than that. So that made me feel okay. And then when I realized I was upset about Uncle Brian going, that, yeah, okay, I'm normal, <laughs> you know. So that was a bit of relief there that, you know, I'm not a, a Vulcan, you know. <laughs> There's uh so so anyway none of us are normal graham this is this is nobody's normal nobody's, nobody's normal, normal. No. so 
There's no such thing. So no, there's not. It forced me to reply to my Auntie Hazel to, to thank her for telling me and to let her know that, yeah, the message, I'd got the message. And I wrote some nice things about my Uncle Brian. You know, when I was a kid, I was into space. And I remember he took me to Jodrell Bank to see the radio telescope. And a funny story is we were, he lived on the, the island of Rothsay in Scotland, the Isle of Butte. Yeah. Rothsay, Isle of Butte in Scotland. And he used to run a cafe on the front there. Everybody in the town knew him. And we were out, it was the day out. There's a, there's a main ferry, the Weems Bay Ferry, but there's another ferry way out on the, 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 the arse end of the island, I suppose. And uh, it's very rural at this other ferry. And we were there, I think we'd only gone there just to see the ferry. We weren't getting on it. We'd come across on it. Anyway, so we're waiting there. And it's, it's a rural Scottish island. Yeah. And there's a bloke rides up on a horse. I mean, this huge, beautiful brown horse. And I don't know, it was probably going on the ferry, the horse. I don't know. Yeah. Bloke rides up on a horse. And I'm standing there with Brian. And this other bloke starts walking towards us. And Brian says to me, he says, uh, this boy here, he's a, he's a really, really, really nice man. He said, but he's a bit simple. He's, uh, he's, he's touched, yeah. but uh, he's a lovely fella. But I just thought I'd let you know. And I'm okay. And I'm like, you know, 12 years old at this, you know, yeah. but he's letting me in. This bloke comes up and he says, hi, hey, Brian, how are you doing? You know, and then he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, fine, fine. He says, uh, that's a fine looking horse, that there. That's a, a beautiful horse. What breed of horse would that be, Brian? And without trying to be funny, with a total straight face, he turns to him and he goes, uh, I think that would be your, um, that's your red setter. Uh, <laughs> and this fella goes, a red setter, is that a fact? Hey, well, it's a fine looking red setter, so it is. <laughs> and I, I always wondered <laughs> whether this fella had like, you know, later that day had been in his local pub or something and he'd be talking to people and they know he's a bit that way. Yeah. And he would have said, oh, I was at the ferry today and a bloke rode by on a red setter. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, that was Brian. Now I've, I, I, I've opened a, a dialogue with my Auntie Hazel, my mum's sister, and, and Brian was her brother, you know. So yeah. I've opened this dialogue. She replied to my email with some details of what's been going on with my mum and my sister because you know I'm disconnected from them yeah and this sentence in particular jumped out she says your dad is still on the shelf at the undertakers because no one has paid the bill for the funeral what <laughs> like I said fine line between tragedy and comedy yes now, my first thoughts were, oh, for goodness sake, you know, between my mum and my sister, you had the funeral, he's been cremated, for goodness sake, pay the bloody bill, right? Yes. My first emotion was, for goodness sake. Yes. Frustration. Yeah. In, he died like, it's nearly a year. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Right? Yes. Oh, dear. This was last night I got this. Uh, so was, I go to bed and Julie said, I said, you won't believe this. <laughs> and Julie put it into perspective perfectly. She said, well, it's what he would have wanted. He would have been so proud because he was such a cheap bugger <laughs> to think that he, that he got a free funeral at the very end. You know, like these, these people who are always late and you say, I bet they'll be late for their own funeral. Yeah. He was always cheap. And I bet he ended up having a funeral that doesn't get... He actually wouldn't care that he's on the shelf and he'd be more bothered that somebody paid for it. A fitting tribute, I suppose. A fitting tribute to a cheap man. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh dear. Yeah. Yeah. So, Aww. like I say, roller coaster of emotions there. Yeah. Oh, it sounds like it. Yeah. <laughs>